he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. It's been a hell of a week. After the successful case earlier this week, I have been given access to a number of case files, including more unknowns. My boss warned me some can and will lead to dead ends or be hoaxes. I ran into a few of those this week. I spent two full days in my car, staking out a farm where crop circles have been appearing on a regular basis. Around midnight, on the second night, I saw the farmer out in his field bending the plants himself. I had a false alarm on a chupacabra, and I met a priest who claimed to have seen a demon in his church. Turns out, the priest passes time with hallucinogenic drugs, and the chupacabra was a malnourished coyote. Even with these cases, I have been excitedly researching every file I could get my hands on. There is no going back from what I have seen. There is more out there than we are aware. My most recent case involving a missing child in Texas named Jonah. Normally, this wouldn't trigger any alarms to be added to my pile, but neighbors and even the family have reported seeing the child. He has been sighted wandering the neighborhood at night, and every report ends the same. Every report ends with the description of his eyes. His eyes are full of something inky black, like looking into the abyss, they say. I did some initial research on the case hitting all the usual places, tabloids, creepypasta, even no sleep itself. Every good lie, every good story is based on a fraction of truth. No source is too ridiculous and I deal with unknowns, so an open mind is a necessity. I gathered what information I could and felt prepared to take on the case. I made my travel arrangements and was to be staying with a retired agent in the area by the name of Frank Ogden. The Bureau believed that his knowledge of the area and local population would be useful in my investigation. I touched down in Dallas and was greeted by Agent Ogden at the gate. Ah, Agent Anomaly, I presume. He boomed with a large smile. Apparently, my reputation preceded me. Ogden was a bit on the heavier side. His time out of the Bureau had seemed to take its toll and he was beginning to round out. I had expected the agent to be older when I heard he was retired, but he couldn't have been older than 40. Ogden shook my hand with a solid grip. I have been briefed on the need to know of your case, and I'm glad we finally have somebody looking into this. It's been hard to get my little one to sleep at night with all the ghost stories this has created. That was when I saw the little boy hiding behind his father holding on to his leg with a death grip. He's a little shy. Ogden said while he pulled the boy out from behind him and ruffled his hair. The boy appeared to be about eight and was trying his hardest to hide from me. He was small for his size, had blonde hair, and looked like he might just cry meeting a stranger. Say hello, Paul, the boy's father insisted. Hi, came the meek little voice. I had never really liked kids, well, not for myself at least. Something about this little guy's anxiety reminded me of myself as a child, though. When we had left the airport, I asked Ogden why he had retired at such a young age. Ogden loaded his son in the car, buckled his car seat, shut the door, and turned to me with tears in his eyes. It was his mother. We both worked at the Bureau and about five years ago. She was killed on assignment. Ogden sniffed and wiped his eyes on his sleeve. I still catch myself dialing the phone some nights thinking she was late coming home. I had to get out of that line of work. It was too dangerous. I need to think about Paul. Ogden looked back to his son, who was fiddling with the Game Boy in the back seat, and he broke the tears with a half smile. On the ride to Ogden's hometown, he filled me in on the local news of Jonah. Apparently, friends and family had been seeing him around wearing the same outfit as the day he disappeared from his home a month prior. The story seemed to coincide with what I had read of the Black Eyed Kid stories. Last night, he had apparently approached a house a few streets over and attempted to get inside. The homeowner did not know the family and was wary of a child at the door past midnight. According to the homeowner, he had asked Jonah where his parents were through the door, and Jonah told him they were out for a walk and they got separated. 
The homeowner called the police, but when he returned to the door, Jonah had left, and despite a search of the area, the police couldn't find any sign of him. Ogden's face hardened into a serious look and lowered his voice with a glance in his rearview mirror at Paul. Did he ever open the door for Jonah? The homeowner is a friend of mine, and he told me something that he didn't tell the police. He was worried they would think he was crazy. He told me that when he looked through the peephole, the boy was already staring at the peephole and spoke to him directly. He even called him by name. He told me that Jonah's eyes were full of something black dripping and his voice didn't sound natural. Paul didn't seem to notice what his father had said and he continued to click away on his Game Boy. After my briefing, I had expected to hear the last detail about his eyes, but it still intrigued me nonetheless. I had to find Jonah. This most certainly qualified as unknown. Ogden's home was in a small town, the kind of town you could drive across in just a couple minutes. Since Jonah had been seen often since leaving home, I had planned on patrolling the town once the sun set. The police department had an APB on him and my direct number if he was seen. I was driving on the edge of town, near where Jonah had been seen the night before. There was a light rain and a fog was starting to muck up my visibility. I was just about to call it night when I saw a young boy on a street corner walk behind a wall. It looked like he was wearing a yellow hooded sweatshirt and blue jeans which perfectly matched the description of Jonah. I pulled around the corner and saw an empty street. The wall that had blocked my view of him was a good eight feet high and it seemed unlikely that he would have been able to climb it. I drove quickly to the end of the wall trying to catch sight of him in the yard past the wall. I pulled past the wall and only saw lawn gnomes and flamingos. The yard was well lit and there was nowhere that he could have hidden so quickly. Disappointed, I returned my eyes to the road and I nearly had a heart attack. I only glimpsed my rearview mirror for a second while turning back forward, but I saw him. Jonah was in my back seat. His eyes were black and he was crying a thick black liquid. He had a wide grin and the black could be seen dripping down his teeth like his gums were bleeding ink. Without thinking, I turned around as fast as I could, but my back seat was empty. I remembered thinking that my imagination must have gotten the better of me. My brain felt slow and my thoughts were hard to focus on. Coming to my senses, I slammed on my brakes and whipped my head forward again, but it was too late. The rain and the distraction caused me to plow my car into a tree with a sickening crunch. I could see the smoke rising from the crumpled hood as I fought my airbag out of my face. I was unharmed and attempted to start the car to no avail. Guess I'm walking back now. I began to pull my phone out of my pocket when I saw a distinct shadow pass over my pocket and heard a tap at my window. Slowly, I turned and was looking directly at Jonah's cold running black eyes. I was mesmerized by them. I could feel every survival instinct in me telling me to run, but all I could seem to do was stare at the boy. The thick black liquid appeared to be running from every orifice on his face, but it never seemed to hit the ground. Will you please help me? I was out with my parents and I got separated. I need to go home. Jonah lied to me through the glass. It was like he was unaware that normal people don't have ink constantly draining from them. My reasoning took over and I could feel the fear receding. I knew he was lying and that fact brought me back to reality and kept me sharp. If he was lying to me, then his intent seemed malicious. What are you doing out here, Jonah? I asked, now questioning to myself whether this really was Jonah anymore. His expression didn't change. His eyes stayed locked on mine and he put his hand on the glass before speaking again. Help me, friend. Something sounded wrong. The boy's voice didn't sound like it had the first time he asked. It was almost as if there was another voice saying the same words at the same time from the same mouth. My thoughts were becoming muddled again, and it took me a moment to realize it. How did he know my name? Let me in! There was now a chorus of voices, male, female, old, young, high, and deep. It simply sounded wrong and made me squirm hearing it. I had to get out of there. I could feel myself losing it, and all I wanted to do was leave him there and run. 
I made a split-second decision to slam my door open to him. He stumbled and fell over as I took off running. I was sprinting as fast as I could through the rain, and I could hear Jonah's multiple voice laugh like it was right behind me. <laughs> Every time I looked back, it seemed he was 20 feet or so behind me, but he was always walking. It felt like a nightmare. No matter how fast you run, the monster is directly behind you. He surely was a monster. The black eyes, the demonic voice. I knew that he could easily overtake me with the way he was always right behind me. He was toying with me. I could see Ogden's house in front of me. The lights on in the living room told me Ogden was still awake. I could almost feel the safety of being indoors and dry with Jonah outside. I vaulted the fence into the yard and that was when Jonah stepped out from the bushes between me and the door, laughing. <laughs> he was laughing like a maniac, teeth dripping black, eyes burning into my soul, never blinking. I looked at my options while Jonah laughed. The house was a single story and there was a section of roof deteriorating on the porch that seemed to sag just low enough to jump and reach. I rushed at Jonah and he seemed taken aback by my sudden aggressive move towards him. As I got close, Jonah made a lunge for me. I jumped over him and grabbed the roof. In a couple seconds, I was pounding my way over the roof of the house, and Jonah was back on his feet, staring at me. I slid down the front side of the roof and crashed to the ground in front of the house. Nothing felt broken, but it sure hurt. The front door flew open, and Ogden was standing there with a pistol. Who is out there? Oh, it's you. Were you on my roof? He asked me, suddenly relieved. Help me up, we have to get inside now. I shouted at him, shattering his relief. Without hesitation, Ogden strode over to me and helped me up and back to the house. As we reached the door, I could see Jonah around the side of the house, same creepy smile and stare. Ogden dragged me in, threw me down and locked the door with every lock it had. There was a knock and we could hear Jonah in a now normal human child voice. Please, can I come in? I'm wet, and it's cold. He was trying to play Ogden. He knew that the father would take pity on a cold, wet child. Ogden's head must have been fogging over like mine did in the car because he began to unlock the door. Listen to me, Ogden. That is no child. He did things I have never seen before. You can't let him in. I pleaded with him. Think about Paul. At the mention of Paul's name, Ogden snapped out of it. He almost looked surprised to see his hand on the lock of the door. We heard Jonah's footsteps on the porch leaving the door and wandering away. I lay on the floor soaking wet and pained from the fall, finally relaxing and just melting into Ogden's carpet. What the hell happened? Ogden was visibly shaken by the events. Was that jump? He stopped abruptly and turned towards the hallway. I had heard it too, tapping on the glass. Then we heard the otherworldly demonic voice. Come here, Paul. Paul! Ogden was off down the hall. I scrambled to my feet and limped my way after him. Paul, get away from the window! I heard Ogden shout as I rounded the corner into Paul's room. After that, a terrifying series of events unfolded, and I feel it will haunt me until the day I die. There was Paul standing by the window with his hand on the glass. On the other side, we could see Jonah mirroring the pose. Paul turned towards us with a scared look on his face. Daddy? 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 Paul's eyes were turning black, like liquid was slowly pouring into them. The blacker his eyes turned, the more voices accompanied his cries for his father. I could see the stream of black liquid draining from Jonah's face, running down his arm and through the cracks under the window, the liquid ran down Paul's arm and into his body. Before long, Paul had the same black dripping eyes and grin, and he was moving towards us. In my research before starting the case, I had believed I would be dealing with a black-eyed kid. I thought if I had just gotten inside, it couldn't follow without permission. I was wrong. This was something else entirely. This was an infection. This thing couldn't be shut out. It made the rules. This was my fault. I had led Jonah back to the house because I thought I knew what he was. I had to try and do something. Paul, you can fight this! 
I lied. I didn't even know if he could hear me, let alone if he could fight it. After my outburst, Paul turned to me, began laughing hysterically, and charged me. <laughs> <laughs> With abnormal strength, he had knocked me to the floor and was holding me to my throat. All I could see was the black abyss behind his eyes. All I could feel was the dripping of the black liquid onto my face while he laughed. I began to lose consciousness. It was almost comforting to leave that terrible thing behind and just fade out. I felt like I was sinking into a tub of warm water, and the laughing became stifled. My thoughts were muddled, and... I felt myself losing control. Suddenly, there was a loud bang, and I came back to the world with a cough and a sputter. <coughs> As the room swirled back into focus and color, I no longer saw the black, but I saw a lot of red. Pa was laying on his back with a gunshot in the side of his chest. Ogden was still holding the pistol and crying profusely with his back against the wall. I noticed as Paul lay bleeding the black drain from his eyes and appeared to start dripping onto the wood floor from his ears. Paul stirred and began to cry. Daddy, what's happening? Where am I? Why can't I breathe? Daddy, where's mommy? Ogden grabbed a towel and tried to stop the bleeding. I swear I heard the black ooze give a final chuckle as it dripped to the floor and pulled with the blood. Could it have been sentient? Paul died before the paramedics arrived. He had no idea what happened and never stopped asking Ogden where his mother was. Ogden couldn't handle what had happened. No matter how much he was told that it wasn't his fault and it wasn't Paul that he had shot, he couldn't forgive himself for shooting his son. Ogden is currently in a Dallas psychiatric ward where he hasn't said a word to anybody. He just stares blankly forward from dawn to dusk. I believe that was the ooze's final trick. It abandoned Paul's body knowing neither could survive because it wanted to see Ogden suffer. The ooze was collected and is currently being studied by a lab in D.C. Jonah showed up home that night and had no recollection of what had happened since he initially disappeared. At least his family got their happy ending. These events will haunt me now. I still feel responsible. If only I hadn't lied to myself and acted like I knew what it was. Please, heed my warning. This was not a black-eyed kid. It didn't need us to open the door. It just needed us to look into its eyes. It can't have been the only one. Don't make my mistake. When you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. <laughs>